need to find this place or we'll be late. Make a left on Astrology Avenue. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant right. It should be right here at 444 Spirit Way. Oh, turn, turn, turn. It looks like Renee. Yay, we're on time. The James and Kelly Show. Great, let's start the show. Well, it's been an interesting time. So yeah. um, I wish to dedicate this to my sister who uh, she had cancer and I came back with chemo. With uh, I personally, depending on the condition of the situation, don't know if I do chemo because I know your mom did. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, depending on what the situation is. Yeah, I think it all depends. Yeah. It all depends because um, you know, she thought she was fine. But we find out that, you know, they said, well, like, she's 17 years old. They said, you know, regular 17 year old person. You know, you look at her spine, and it's you know, like a door, an old door falling off the hinges, the hinges are rusted, yeah. the paint is peeling, and um, you get, your sister has holes in the door. Uh, so it's just, it's, I don't know, I don't know, uh, it's, it depends on the condition. But, um, the interesting thing which I want to share with everybody is experience because it was very interesting. I was here, I uh, was about, I guess, a week ago, maybe a week and a half, mm -hmm. and my sister was in the hospital then, and she was conscious. But I'd be in my uh, shaving or getting ready or eating breakfast, and she would come to me very, very clearly, like she was already passed over, very clearly. And she told her how proud she was of me. She loves me. I'm always with you. And then she mm -hmm. said, Sister Rosalie's helping me out. I'm like, great. And who's Sister Rosalie, I'm thinking. So I asked my other sister, uh, and, and she said, um, oh, yes, that was Sister Rosalie from Camp Days. Her favorite nun at camp, which she was age 11, was Sister Rosalie. Wow, so she was already talking to you. Already talking to me. Yeah. And the only time this happened is when my father passed away. Before he passed away, he was in a coma, and he was right above his head. I could see him. And he said, um, he doesn't want to go until we decide we're not going to argue about his state or his house. And we, we told him we would not argue, and he was gone. So many times they need to hear from the living, it's okay to go. Well, I know that when my mom was passing, she literally grabbed me and said, am I dying? Oh, I had that four times. And you had that. I mean, right? And then wow. and when I, and I said, to, I looked at my family that we were all there and I said, you tell them the truth. I said, yes, mom, you are. Yes, you are dying. Yes. I had to say that because I was afraid if I didn't, the other ones would say, no, you're going to be fine. Yeah. I said, I, I can't do that. I had, she, I knew I had to let her go. It was one of the hardest. But it was very traumatic. Yeah, yeah. I, it was one of the hardest things I ever had to go through, honestly, really was, because she would ask me for a time, she pointed to the truth, that's the truth. She goes, am I dying? Am I dying? And I didn't know what to say, because you don't want to say, yes, you're dying. I said, Lynn, we're going to take a magic carpet ride, and I'm going to be there with you. And I said, and we're going to have a good time. And it's a good time. I said, this is going to be the worst. I didn't say yes. And say no, but said this is the worst of it right here. Which the pain you're because she was that was before she could be on any really good pain medication. Oh. And I tell everybody there's no reason to be in pain. Souls don't need to suffer. That's not part of the program. They don't need to suffer. Uh, souls aren't meant to suffer. So in that case, I believe so much in letting them euthanize them, just like we do animals. Let's switch to humans. Oh. There's no reason to keep them going like that. That was the worst thing ever traumatic for everybody and it wasn't her you know she's trying it was it was just traumatic so i said you know you're there's no death on that one point i said after the fourth time she asked my dying said there's no death there's a party going on and then she go in and she go well the party's happening and they're cleaning the windows getting all ready for me so that was going on so it was an up and down in and out which a lot of people have that situation when you're losing someone they go in and out of consciousness and um yeah the other two days ago Porch with the hospice it was Saturday. Um, so it was well, maybe Friday at night, but I came back on Thursday. And um, she, my other sister, told me that she reached up to the heavens, physically moved, and she couldn't move. Reached up to her ex husband, Dennis, and she was reaching him. So she's ready to go. We know that. Yeah. So um, I want, yeah. she had a sense of humor. She would said, stitches in her head because she had a head operation at one point, and she starts itching him. And and myself, my sister, and this is a you can't do that. And you know, said, you really think it fucking matters? <laughs> <laughs> I can hear her say that. Really? <laughs> Who gives a shit? She said. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I I was there, I think, to keep me keep her going. Um, I would say silly things like I'd say grimacing in that fr very frowny face and turn that frown into a clown because to keep the energy up and, and right. the light. Um, some a couple of things was going on. So she came to me when I was in my house before she passed. We found out Sister Rosalie was indeed her, her nun she loved. Wow. She kept on like, showing me a dream I had all sitting in front of my house in Queens when I was a kid. And all the neighbors were there. 
that she knew. And all these people she's helped came down the streets and thanked her. Mm-hmm. And her old, uh, her ex-husband who completed suicide at 23 years ago, was standing there in his old, God, I haven't seen it in years, flannel shirt, box of Marlboros, um, <laughs> a brown jacket with white cur- uh, fur line, and typical. And he's standing there, and he's spitting out of his mouth, which he used to do. And so he goes, your sister. I said, what's going on? What with her? She goes, she, she won't get, come out yet because she's getting her hair ready, which was a typical thing of my sister in those days. So I told her about that when I saw her, and she lightened up. So when someone's in that situation, everybody, I think it's our job to help them as end-of-life doulas, which and it's a whole other story. Yeah. Because I was kind of the first ones to come up with that phrase, end-of-life doulas, you know, at my Omega class when people would stand up. They say help people over what we call that. So let's call it end of life doulas. And that caught on. I don't it know. It sure did catch on. It really yeah. has. And it, yeah. You know, because yeah. So anyway, what we could do is just keep up that energy, I guess. So she was coming to me then, and then the plane ride, I played a song called um uh, Tommy the Who song. And it was from Tommy the Who. And it was uh Welcome to the Camp. Welcome to the camp. I know we'll know why you're here. Just singing it. Well, the next day at the hospital, my sister opens her eyes with Welcome to the camp. I know we all know that you're here. So there's oh, a wow. so the soul itself is well, not- and also though you two had a, have a real deep connection. I mean, yeah. not only is she your sister, but I mean you're both very intuitive. Yeah, very much so. And she's um, we've done it many times before. We passed over. We we're generals in a war and the whole thing. And and it was just interesting for me to learn that that soul. Um, just like what we're going to do with the Alaskan crew is leaving the body. We can go other places, mm-hmm. places where we're still in this physical body. So this is not this is just a little part of us. So she was able to go to these different places. And I kept mm-hmm. on saying to her, Lynn, you're, this is just the bottom part. You're already over. You're happy. You're happy. Look, go to the party. Just close your eyes. When you wake up, it's going to be bright and beautiful and peaceful. And we got to do that for them as part of our job. Mm-hmm. So when, when I went there, I was work for two days with my family, put the whole family together, which is lovely. And then 10 o'clock on Thursday night, almost exactly 10 o'clock, I was with my other family members there and spirits came in the room and there are all different types of spirits. I can't tell you who it was, but there were those like shadows, but light shadows, white. And the room was filled with people, filled with beings. And I used to see this when I worked at a hospital up in Los Angeles when I lived there doing temporary work. I worked uh, before the mediumship. I worked in a hospital, and I used to go deliver things to the AIDS floor, which just had just opened. Because no one was willing to go up there, I went up there, and I used to see groups of beings going from one room to another room, and then to another room. I think they were preparing that person to pass. But my sister, they said to me as a group thought, "It's your time to go now, James. You need to leave now." Just like that. So I turned to my sister. I got to go now. My time was done, and it was as if they were came in to prepare her mindset cleansing her it's interesting the process of that because you know as uh elizabeth kubler ross talks about the many stages of death mm-hmm. it's very very true yeah and and us humans have to go through that as well as a part yeah. of, of those seven stages yeah well they are and and currently you know you're you're also you and your family are dealing with it and a lot of people have dealt with this uh, anticipatory grief yeah, tell us a bit more about that. Well, anticipatory grief is the grief that occurs before a loss. So we know that she's going to pass, but you don't know when. And you're it's that that feeling. And, and with me in my mom's case, it lasted for mm-hmm. weeks because I didn't know when she was going to pass. And um, it's it also um, it's it's uh, it's um, how do I say this? It's one way that people react to the knowledge, maybe that a life changing loss is going to happen in the near future. And so what it does on some level is it um, it can help us actually if there's unfinished business. If, if you're able to go there, it can help us with and, that. And in our situation, it definitely has. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that like you were saying today on your show earlier, you were talking about having um, f- forgiveness is something. Forgiveness you know, is if there's been an issue with in families. And by the way, what families have not had that? Every single you know, yeah. Right? I mean, we were talking about dysfunction earlier. I mean, come on. All families have, have their things that they go through. I was, I was reading, reading this, which I've probably been reading a lot of this. Active dying. And what is active dying? Active dying is the final phase of the dying process. While the pre-active stage lasts for about three weeks, the active stage of dying lasts roughly three days. Uh-huh. But interesting. In the Bible, three days, he has risen this. You know, yeah. the- and Easter is coming. 
Easter's coming, Passover. And Passover's coming. Yeah. I mean, her timing is divine. Actively <laughs> dying patients are very close to death and, and exhibit many signs and symptoms near death. For instance, actively dying uh, patients are often seen unresponsive and the blood pressure often drops significantly. As we were there, her respiration kept on dropping. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the symptoms of active dying include lung pauses in breathing, uh, blood pressure drops significantly, patient's skin changes of color, uh, which happened to my sister. One day she was yellow, one day she was white, so she was red. She had no platelets left, so she got bruises everywhere as well. Yeah, there's no platelets left. And the uh, hallucinations, delirium, agitation. And that's really, they don't need agitation. I, I, I've, I've been around many dying people, but um, I, I got to tell you, it is, as Spirit says, it's a very natural process. The act of dying itself is easy. We do it every night. It's getting there, like the cancer, yeah. the disease leading up to it is the worst part. Like I told my sister, this is the worst part. Again, you there are medications. There are pain medications. You know, I live in a state that you're allowed to emancipate yourself when time comes up. And uh, I think that's the right thing to do. Um, more end of life uh, resources. You're preparing for death of a parent. Yep. Blood pressure. Breathing patterns. Yep. And she hasn't uh, eaten in eight weeks or drank. Oh, so that oh happened. Oh my gosh. It is an amazing healing time. And I always look even to the, the worst situations, even the tornadoes that have happened and they've been misplaced. And I always try to look at the opportunities that are shown there, yeah. what we can do to change things for the better. Because even though it, it, it seems it's terrifying and things are bad, there's always going to be an opportunity. I, I always believe that. Oh, I always believe to the last moment that soul can learn something or we can learn something from that soul. I think it's really important this yeah. period of time, yeah. you know. Have you ever heard that expression, James? Um, I used this when I was did my mom's memorial. Do not go gent gentle into that good night. Have you heard that one? Do not go gentle into that good night. I have heard that. Okay. Because we the, I thought that was a, an interesting one because it's the rest of it is rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wow. And I will tell you this. My mother did not go gentle into that good night. <laughs> she just did not. And so because of that, you know, the trauma was a little greater even. Sure, sure. You know? I could see it for my sisters only, uh, the whole thing, the stages, because there was definitely denial. I'm not going. I'm not yeah. ready to say it. There was really anger. She was pissed off. Oh, I bet. Oh, yeah. And then there was acceptance. She, she finally accepted it. Yeah. It's just yeah. a, it's an interesting thing. But as well as the families and friends, families to go through that. And, this and I think that all of us will be going through these we will experiences. All work. And she yeah. said something which I've heard many years, of course, which is, um, you know, it's like a dream. And it is because once she wakes up on the side, it, she's going to look back and it's going to seem like a dream. And yeah. in her case, very interestingly, I was told a lot about her. In her case, they said her mission is to go over and help people who help people pass over. Oh, okay. So isn't that interesting. She's going to help people. So that's, that is interesting because okay. of, she'll probably bring a lot of families together then. In that, yeah. wow. Wow. Um, um, yeah. What I can say to you? Um, well, this is something really interesting. This came up in a reading years ago, but a year ago, a year ago. And can I, you know the story. It's a great one. It was in, I think exactly, it was in Houston. And I uh, brought this girl, I think it was a mother. Mother was very ill for a long time in a wheelchair, suffered from diabetes. Um, I'm not sure they amputated part of her body off. I don't know what the details were, but she was in a coma for quite a bit, like two or three weeks. And the mother came through with really interesting information. She said, she heard, even though she was on, uh, in a coma state, she heard every word that her daughter would say. And she said, especially the prayers and that you had for me. Remember this? I received them when I passed over here. Every single word. Yes. They were was waiting for me when I passed on and met me when I came here. Yes. So all the words of that beautiful prayer and stories are waiting. So when we see someone at the end of the life time, yes. and we say prayers or think of them, all that love is waiting for them. That goes into that energy of the reception when they pass over. Right, right. Right, James. Oh, I agree. I agree. So let's talk about how to handle, you know, either their emotional needs or your emotional needs. Because it's a lot, James, when a, when somebody goes through something like this. You know, for the families, it's a lot. I mean, how did you hold space for one another while you were? Well, that's a great way of saying it, holding space. Because and you never know from family, family dynamics, and I know. history. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I don't, really there was a disagreement we had for many years, and it's been questions for many years. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it's an amazing thing. And I don't know if all families go through this or not, but we all came together in our own respective way. 
and, and appreciate each other and respect each other and realize that everybody is going through this in their own way um, and they have to go through their own way. Uh, it, it's very easy for uh, someone to lash out and say a child, or, you know, the, or the mother, to lash out another a sibling and say something out of ups, up being upset. So at one point, I was with my niece, niece and my nephew and they were talking and started arguing. I said, okay, stop. Let's breathe. Let's just breathe because it's going to be very emotional now, and your emotions are trying to you know, cloud up your 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 patterns of thinking correctly. So right. you've got to calm the emotions just for a moment here, and let's recognize each other. We're doing the best we can with what we know. And so that know, was beautifully said. Yeah, and, and yeah. The, the one son is still traumatized over his father's suicide twenty three years oh, ago. God, you no, know, it's very difficult. Oh, well, I so would we, think that this would be bringing up a lot for. For it, anybody it, that's been in that situation, I think if we share it with family members, yeah, going through at that time, I think that's mm -hmm. really, really healthy to share mm -hmm. what, what I'm feeling about this and that. And even though I'm 3,000 miles away, I'm texting everyone and talking to them. I so you're all connected then? We're all connected. I think it's yeah. the best thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. And, I, and also, for my sister, I wanted to mention to everybody, uh, unfortunately, and my mother, now this is interesting because I was sitting in the lobby of the hospital with my other sister, Maura, and we're talking about our other sister. And I had not felt my mother or father around. I'm like, why well, felt all these nuns and everything? And then my mother came to me at the lobby. Your mother rarely comes to me that I'm aware of. Right. But when I, someone I'm reading there, they're not in it, I can get it. My mother's personality came through so strong. She said, she's the same in death as she was in life. She's difficult. <laughs> she won't move. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> And but, that's pretty funny. <laughs> it was really pretty funny. And then she said to my sister, I was with you when you lit the candle for the baby. And I said, you understand what that means? She goes, yes, this past weekend I was in Boston and there was a christening of my grandchild and a little kid lit a candle bar right afterwards. So that was very significant. Oh, thanks everybody. Appreciate your help. Thanks everybody. All right, James. Thanks, I love you, James. Oh, God bless you. You've been listening to Both Sides Now and Beyond, featuring spiritual medium and master teacher James Van Prague and spiritual medium and psychotherapist Kelly White. That was great. Maybe we changed some lives. And maybe opened up some minds. Which way do I turn? Uh, right. Uh, I, I mean left.